Hey. Scrub it. Scrub here. Um, there is something there. Could be water buck. That could be the water buck I was looking for. Oh, that scrub here is a fighting. Let's go look at that. That's pretty amazing, actually. Boxing each other. They're almost like kangaroos when they do that. nervous impala in the background. He has one of the hairs. Now, unfortunately the other one sort of moved off a little bit. It might be they just don't want to fight with witnesses present. Just looking for the other one quickly. Oh, it's there. Alright, so we're going to switch off and maybe... Was that, have you got it? Okay. Maybe with the lights off they might get back together again. Pardon? Other ones moved about 20 yards away, so they might have... I don't know if it was more courtship behavior or fighting, but they were bouncing around each other in ways that was just not really that normal or often seen. Hmm, anything is, I can't see anything now. Okay. Yeah, this is kind of awkward. I can't comment on anything because I can't see it. And you don't have a microphone. Hmm. I think our presence disturbed them. Let's carry on. Other one's grazing. The other one looks very pale. Maybe it's just in the bright light. Oh, when did this tree go over? Long time ago. What am I saying? Not recent, really. No, it's not recent. Long time ago. Lights, camera, action. Live TV from the African bush lot. I also had, this is still staying on the Finland theme, my very, very first international guests in the bush were Finnish. Teppo and Tarja. Teppo Leitinen and Tarja, his wife. Well, I worked with Teppo, and he used to come to Timbavati with me quite often. This was in the early 80s, before I even worked in the bush proper. I used to bring friends to the bush, but my first international guests was when well, I used to bring Teppo, he and my brother, and we'd come for the weekend. But then Teppo's wife came out from Finland to visit because he was here on contract for a year. And when Taria was here, we took her to the bush, to our place in the Timbavati. And they loved it. Did a couple of trips, in fact, when Tario was here. And in those days, I used to walk around the Timbavati without even without a rifle, without shoes. I still do, actually. But I mean, that's how how long ago it was in the early 80s. So it's like 20 years ago, 20 something years ago, 25, 26. 
27 years ago. 26 years ago. But there's a red pressula. Oh, we can't get color. I'm just going to have a look at it so we can come back and I can get this on color camera. But here is a yellow either Crassula, Kalanchori. Interesting. Let's come and look at that. Nice flower. Tiny little flower on a long stalk. Very much like the one that I picked up today, which is yellow. That one's a red one. like a bush baby or something in there but it's not going to be able to pick it up on camera not through this I can't see it's moved now maybe it was a bush baby it's an eye see now what we're doing for, for night time stuff is although we use infrared when we find an animal it's the finding the animal that requires visible light for us humans and it's very difficult to actually make out the shape of an animal in the darkness especially through looking through the trees through the bushes uh, the key thing is in this exercise is to pick up the reflection in their eyes and that is done through an extra special layer of light reflective cells that lie in the back of the eye behind the retina special name for it too, it's called the Tepetum lucidum. And the Tepetum is what we see when we get, like when you have an animal in the headlights of your car or something. And us humans don't have it, so we don't have eyes that reflect back in light. Some other, a lot of, a lot of other primates don't, a lot of other diurnal animals don't have a Tepetum. Owls have a, an even better one. Owls have, gosh, well they have, I forget how it works. I remember seeing a documentary once. And a lot of it was, well, it was all about owls and how specialized their flight feathers are. How specialized, well, most of their feathers are specialized to cut out the sound of the air moving over the body, you know, you know giving them silent flight. Night jars too have also got not quite the same features. But how an owl's eye is adapted, and of course owl's eyes are exceptionally large, take up most of the face. And are immovable in the skull. They're one of the few creatures, warm blooded animals, that has an immovable eye. That's immovable, not removable. Take out the eye. But, uh, was that Herman? Yeah. Um, since I'm going to go through a dip, I'll get a question from FC. While we might lose track of us. but now is it the name please Jill Joel sorry Joel I was talking about other Joel Joel is who delivers our fuel Joel's asking a question now from Camp Hill where's Camp Hill Florida 
Do we ever give medical help to the PA, Pennsylvania? 17011 zip code. PA is Pennsylvania. Campbell, Pennsylvania. Uh, Joel, yes, we do. There are some instances, there are some circumstances. I'm going to just pause here because we're going through a signal prep problem possibly. These drainage lines sometimes cut out when we go through them. Pan, chela meaning frog, frog pan, normally full of frogs in the summer. It's a little incredible amount of water still in the pan. Whoa! Sour plums? Could be. Joel. Under certain circumstances, in fact, they're quite easy to define. No, they're not, actually. We've had a few discussions about this in the past. But where man's influence, or where man's negligence, or man's humans. Notice I say man's, because you don't really get women poachers. Only macho men that have to prove themselves by doing things. Sorry, I won't wax lyrical about that. But, <clears throat> where humans have interfered to the... Well, there we go, let's not use that word. Where humans have caused an injury or caused the discomfort or the problem with an animal those are circumstances where we would administer medical help uh, animals that have been caught in poachers snares or god forbid um, knocked by a vehicle or pick up some problem as a result of the negligence of humans around the camps it would certainly warrant, in fact, it would, it would be imperative that we do something about it. But as far as natural injuries and natural, occur natural occurring things are concerned, <coughs> excuse me, there's not really much we can do. It is far more, in a lot of cases, far more detrimental and stressful to the animal for a human, for it to be darted and treated and have to wake up with antibiotics and have the smell of humans on it and the smell of just all of that that goes with darting an animal and fixing it and it, 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 that can sometimes lead to an animal's death quicker than the injury to the animal in fact in more cases than, than, than not there's a phenomenon that is known as capture myopathy which is a stressful condition that animals suffer from after capture and this is something that has been studied in depth because of the amount of game that has moved around from game reserve to game reserve and in the beginning of early days of game capture before drugs were, were refined to the point that they are now many animals used to die in captivity shit just by being caught uh, let alone having something wrong with them or having an injury that is fixed and so when it comes to say the bite marks on a lion from another lion or uh, gosh I don't, don't want to go through the range of possible injuries but anything that is caused that is that happens to an animal in the day-to-day -day course of their lives in an environment that as much as we love it and as much as we seem to have this passive um, voyeur, voyeuristic activity there are dangers here and it is kind of a kill or be killed kind of world I mean it's we see animals we see very seldom see them fighting we say very seldom see them hunting <coughs> so on one hand it's not a very dangerous world on one hand it's it's 
if you know what you're doing, I mean, we look at the scrub hairs earlier, and how dangerous can it be if a little bunny rabbit can be wandering, or I call it a rabbit, I'm sorry, a little scrub hare can be hopping around the bush. But the scrub hare has adapted over millions of years to be able to hear the slightest hint of danger. It's got those beautiful big ears, uh, it's got a twitchy little nose to pick up the scent of danger, but more than that, it's going to be able to hear danger coming and react accordingly. The injuries that are caused by perhaps a hunt going wrong or I don't know, let's just not go into that detail, but the injuries that are caused by the day-to-day -day interactions of animals is something that nature, it's not that nature has to take care of it, nature has taken care of it for millions of years and this is something that we can't really um, the bush that we're in now is relatively unchanged. The only thing that is different about it now than two million years ago is that there are roads in it and a game lodge every now and then and a few water holes that have been put in um, so they're artificial water points. But other than that, if we take any spot, let's say any spot just off of the road, that spot has been that way for millions of years and it's a very, very, very big national park that we're in at the moment. Technically, we're in the Sabi Sand Game Reserve. Even want to get even more technical, we're in the Juma Game Reserve within the Sabi Sand Game Reserve within the Kruger National Park. But all those names are semantics when it comes to the overall region that actually is available to animals to roam in because the animals don't recognize this as Juma. They don't recognize it as the Sabi Sand. To them it's just all the Greater Kruger National Park. And it being such a vast area, there are probably we probably only get to see one or two at Juma. Not even less than one percent of the animals in Kruger. Less than one percent. So kind of I'm gonna have to stop again because we're going through a dip. Excellent. I'm at Twin Dam. back again and I'm going to Gari Main and we're going to drive quite a distance along Gari Main up to the west because well there's a cat to be seen unless we find our own on the way but there's a cat up the road that we want to go and see and sadly we didn't see it an hour ago but so be it. So now I've got to get back to where I was because I'm going to be heading north along the road. Copy, thanks. I'm on my way. <coughs> Excuse me, getting a bit of a frog in the throat. Joel, I was answering that question about animals. Well, I think I. Sorry, Joel. Whoa! Oh, sure. Shame, child. Poor child flew into the microphone. Gonna have a bit of a headache, but she'll be alright. Good thing. Invert beep. Okay, well, I'm gonna do something that I've never done before. Um, I'm going to drive a little bit faster than normal up Gary Main. 
if the inverter is beeping, technically we should switch it off because we're not allowed to drain the batteries. So what I can do, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We switch it off now. We're going to head up Gowrie Main and you go to Gowrie Dam and we'll be back with you. I'm going to see if I can get to the Leopard and maybe in about 10 or 15 minutes we'll be able to get to the Leopard and then we'll switch on again for a few minutes. How's that sound, Herman? Okay, Herman, if you can cut away now. Um, folks, we'll be back with you in a few. We're going to switch off the inverter so that we can save a little bit of battery just to get to the Leopard. So, see you in a few minutes. Bye. Hello everybody, this is Harman on Final Control again. And as Mark quickly explained, our inverter uh, is beeping on the vehicle, which means our batteries are very low. So uh, we're just quickly switching everything off, and they're going to make their way, hopefully, to the Leopard. And uh, the next few minutes, we'll uh, be able to, hopefully, once again, cut uh, back to the Jigger uh, with, uh, with a very, very nice uh, Leopard. So uh, please stay tuned, and uh, we're going to cut back to the Jigger in about 10 minutes or so.
Welcome back everybody. Got a few minutes left of batteries and we're approaching a leopard here, just off of Zoe's Road where the old hyena den is. Bit of a drainage line. I'm not too sure, I can't really see much in front of me. I'm just looking at the ditch in front of me. Wow. I'm gonna try and go to the right here. I wonder if that could be Karula. Was one of the boys. Seems to be scenting something. Definitely scenting something. This is what Africa is all about, everybody. Do we need to switch that off? Induna. Is that a stubby tail that I see there? I think that's Induna. I think I saw a stubby tail. Very uneven ground here. Thanks, Andrew. Battery's a bit of a break there, it seems to. Oh, there's a Stenbuck. Probably what he was looking at. And he just walked past the span. Probably what he's been scenting. That's a lucky Stenbuck. Moving through this terrain and this grass at night, not an easy thing to follow. So we're not getting much there. He is not getting much of a view of him until he stops, maybe. I'm gonna come out on Rebecca's road.
little scenting something. This is a leopard we call Induna. He's one of the two subadult males, youngsters of Karula, our queen of Juma. Scenting something in the grass there. Almost not quite Fleming. Oh, he's a magnificent animal already. He's got a full tummy. Well, not full, but definitely been eating recently. Do you need light on him? Oh, good. Light. Not poor compared to Juma. To Henry's life. Chris Crossing, he's definitely scenting something, whether it's his mother or his brother or who knows. And um, I think we can leave him. Because I've got to switch off now anyway. Getting beeping from batteries. He's gone into the thicket and we managed, we were, we were lucky enough to find him. We were very lucky to get here. So I think what we're going to do, I mean, it, we definitely don't want to have a scenario like we had recently when the batteries didn't get enough charged because they were just too depleted that uh, it's best when they start beeping like this for us to head home now and get them on charge for tomorrow. We've got a big day tomorrow. We've got our morning drive and we are second half of our first aid course and then uh, Rangers Race Part 2 or rather what could we call it? Um, what did you say? Part 2. No, what I'm thinking of is the second leg of the Rangers race or Patrick's race tomorrow. My name is Mark. Thanks Tyra on camera and thanks Herman in final control. Fantastic evening and a fantastic afternoon with you all. I hope we've entertained you. I hope you've enjoyed. I hope you maybe learned something because that's also what it's all about. Us being able to teach you something here and there. And of course, us maybe learning from you. Okay, batteries are beeping. I get the message. Bye-bye <laughs> everybody. Love you lots. See you tomorrow.